Good afternoon. We are so glad to finally get the show going. Uh, originally scheduled for that last week of October, it has been canceled and postponed, but we're here. We have a whole cast together. They're out of quarantine and isolation, and I think they're all healthy. And we're really, really thankful that you guys are here. It's a small but well-masked audience. So glad to have you. Uh, tonight, we're, they are performing a play called The Imaginary Invalid by uh, Moliere. Moliere was a writer and performer, actor in the second half of the 17th century, and dominated the world of French comedy. Uh, he loved satire. He combined satire and slapstick humor, as you'll see tonight, often having his plays end with a happy ending. So we hope that you will sit back, enjoy, be refreshed. We really want an audience that feels free to laugh, so we'd love to hear your laughter and your applause. Um, but let me give thanks. Oh, I, would, I should say it is a three-act play. There will be a 15-minute intermission between act two and three, uh, so you'll be able to get up and stretch your legs a little bit. Let me pray, let me give thanks, and then we'll start the show. Heavenly Father, we really are thankful to be together this afternoon. Thank you for the family and friends who are here to support us. Thank you for those who are watching virtually. We thank you for them. Uh, Lord, we take pleasure in the arts, in drama, uh, being able to laugh, to find humor, even in ourselves, Lord God. I ask that you would bless the performers, help them with all that they prepared with, and Lord, we give you the thanks and praise. May it be to your glory, and it is in your name that we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. Make 
another item. 30. 32. Oh, my time for us. Gently, if you please. You must not plunge sick people so. <laughs> they are unable to, to take the, the stresses, much less being sick. <coughs> Be satisfied with what I give you. <coughs> and uh, let's see, this month I have taken five, yeah, ten animals and thirteen mixtures. And, and last month I took sixteen animals. <laughs> and 20, 23 mixtures. Oh, I, I am not quite surprised that I am not so well this month as the last. I, I should see to it that I, that I inform Madame Bourgeon about it, that she may set the matter, the matter right. Uh, oh, 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 
to, I will dissemble to you, but you must know that it was acquaintances, that it was, it was by chance that we became acquaintances six days ago, and the result which has been made to you, for my hand is a direct result that we, at first sight, had for each other. They, they did not, they did not tell me this, but I am glad of it, and I am glad that matters are so. They tell me that he is a tall young man, well made. Yes, sir. Of good stature. Yes. Well bred. No doubt. Well born. Couldn't be better. Who speaks Latin and Greek well. That which I do not know. And uh, he is to take his physician's exam in the next uh, three days. He, father? Yes, has he not told you? No, who told you? <laughs> Madame Pujol. Does Madame Pujol know? <laughs> uh, a pretty question, seeing as Madame Pujol is the aunt of Cleot. Madame Aunt of Thomas Deaforest. I do not know where this name came from. I, she's the, she, she's, he's the nephew of Madame Pujol? Yes. Yes, yes, exactly, my point. And this class which you, I see you have written here in a love letter, should not be, it is not, his name is Thomas Deaforest, and Dr. Deaforest and Madame Poujon and Madame Florent have settled the match this morning. And why the surprise, Doctor? It, it is, Father, that you are speaking of one person and I have assumed another. What, sir? You could have formed this ridiculous design, and with all the wealth you have, you'd marry your daughter to a physician? What are you interfering with, you oh, impudent? Good gracious, gently. You begin immediately with the insults. Can I not argue without getting into a passion? There, see, let us answer each other in cool blood. What, if you please, is your reason for such a match? My reason? Is that seeing myself? <coughs> in her and ill. I should see to it that I have within my own family, in my own way, the remedies and the mixtures and the medicine which I I I need to make myself well. The prescriptions and consultations as well. Well, that is your reason, and may I just say, it is a pleasure to answer each other gently. But, sir, consult your own conscience. Are you really ill? She will not. 
And why is that? Oh, well, your daughter will tell you that she would have nothing to do with your Dr. Deaforest, nor with her son, Thomas Deaforest, nor with any of the Deaforests in the world. I have to do with them. Besides that, the match is more advantageous than the world imagines. This Madame Poussin <coughs> makes 8,000 liters a year. And along with that, that is actually, without reckoning, the, the mother's property. Oh, well, she must have made a great lot of money from killing people if she's that rich. Uh, well, and along with that, I must say, this, this match is, is quite advantageous. All that is well and good, sir, but I advise you, between the two of us, to choose another husband for your daughter, and she is not made to be Tom, Mrs. Deaforis. I wish it to be so. Oh, don't say so. How do not say so? No! The, one might say you are not thinking of what you are saying. I am thinking of what I am saying, and one may say what one might. Oh, sir, it is my duty as your servant to not allow you to commit any folly. I will not approve of this marriage. What, in, in what sort of world are, they, are we in? And, and what kind of audacity is this that, that a servant may speak in this manner to her master? Oh, well, if you are so certain, what will you do if she doesn't do what you say? I shall place her in a convent. Oh, you! Yes, she shall become a nun. Good. 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 H how good? You will not place her into a convent. I will not place her into a convent. No. And, and why should I not place her in a convent? Oh, your paternal tenderness will prevent you. It will not. Oh, a tear or two, arms thrown round the neck. My darling little papa will be enough to convince you. All of that will have no effect. Yes, yes. No, 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 no. Oh, good heavens, I know you. You are naturally kind-hearted. I am not. In fact, I may be quite a spiteful old man if I wish it. Then please, sir, you forget that you are ill. <coughs> <coughs> Sir, she will not marry your Thomas Deaforest. I shall teach you a lesson for speaking to me in that way. I forbid it to be so. And it is in my interest not to let you commit any folly. Oh, 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 continue speaking to me like that. I shall teach you what to say. Oh. Angelique, will you not stop her for me? Father, don't forget your, your medicine. I will disown her if she obeys you. <coughs> Diligent, careful, handy, and above all faithful. Besides, 
You know we must be very careful with who we bring in nowadays. Now, Toinette. Toinette! Yes, madam. Why must you put my husband into a passion? I, madam? I would never do such a thing, and I strive to please master in everything. No wretch. Well, madam, he told us that he would have his daughter married to a doctor. I told him that the match was most advantageous, but that he would do better to put her into a convent. No, no, <laughs> darling. There is not much wrong with this, and I do believe she is right. You cannot believe the insolence of this, this wretch, this, this good for nothing, this, this baggage. Go. 
who are rather much more accommodating, who can glide gently over the law and bend it a little bit. They have the ability to smooth the difficulties of your situation. Without people like that, people like me, where would we be every day? I mean, the rules were made in order to be broken. Imagine if Prometheus never broke any rules. We would still be in the dark. Flexibility, that's what's key. Without it, there is no worth left in my profession. How then, madame, do you propose I should go about doing this and give all that I have to my wife and fully deprive my children of it? <laughs> How are you to do? You can silently give all that you can to, to me, an intimate friend of your wife's, and they will give it all back to her. In the meantime, however, you can give to your wife valuables or jewels or Money, while you're still alive. Good heavens, child. You must not torment yourself with all of this. If I should happen to lose you, the world will no longer have any meaning for me. <laughs> yes, oh. my friend, if I should happen to lose you, life will be meaningless. Oh, oh my love. And I shall follow you to show the tenderness that I am for you. Oh, my God. come to this yet. <clears throat> Madam, you do not know what it is to have a husband that one loves well. <clears throat> well, then, darling, yes. within your very, very capable hands, I, I should like to put the 8,000 <laughs> francs and gold that I have in the recess of my bed, and uh, two bills payable, one to Monsieur Gérard, uh, two thousand francs, and the other two payable to Monsieur uh, de Mont. Pay, uh, no, 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 I cannot think of these things, dear. But, um, darling, how much did you say was in the recess? 8,000 francs in gold, my love, and 2,000 francs payable to the Monsieur Gérard. Oh, do not speak to me of property, but, uh, dear, how much did you say the two bills were for? Ah, 2,000 for Monsieur Gérard and 4,000 for Monsieur de Mont. All the riches in the world are nothing compared with you. Shall we proceed with the making of the will? Yes, yes. Uh, we shall actually be more comfortable in my in my study. Come, darling. Direct me. And, and Madame de Bonaflora, please. Thank you, thank you. Will 
pretend to no longer take interest in you and to enter into the interests of your father and stepmother. Try, I pray you, to send word to Cleant about the impending marriage. <laughs> there is no one that I can trust with this task other than the old you sayer, my lover, Punch. <laughs> oh, it will cost me some sweet words, which I do not begrudge on your account. Tomorrow, I will send word to him right away, and he will be absolutely delighted to take care of I am being called. Good night. Rely upon me. What is your pleasure, sir? What is your pleasure? <sighs> it is you! What a surprise! What come you to do here? To learn my fate, to speak to the amiable Angelique, to consult the sentiments of her heart, and to ask her decision about this fatal match of which I have been informed. Yes, but you must be careful not to speak so inconsiderately to Angelique. This has all been handled in secret. You no, you no doubt know about the careful watch under which she is being kept, how she is not allowed to talk to anyone, nor to go out, and it is only by the curiosity of an old aunt who obtained permission for us to attend this comedy which gave rise to your passions, and we have been very careful not to speak of this adventure. This is true, but for this reason do I not come as Cleant in the guise of her lover, but as a friend of her music teacher, of whom I obtain leave to say that I come in his stead. Oh, here comes our man. Retire a little, and I will introduce him to you. Where is my walk? Thank you. Madame Fajon has instructed me to walk a dozen times back and forth, but I, I forgot to ask her whether she meant the length or the breadth or the width of the room. Sir, um, there is a man here who wishes to speak with you. Speak, speak low, you hangnoggy. You forget that I am ill, and invalids should not be spoken to at such high volumes. Of course. Sir, um, I need to say that... I said, speak low. Sir, I mean to say that... What is it? I mean to tell you, sir, that... What? 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 What do you say? There is a man here who wishes to speak with you. Bring, bring him in. Sir. Oh, speak low for fear of shaking the master's brain. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, I'm charmed to find you up and to see that you are convalescent. How? Convalescent master is very, very ill. <coughs> I heard it said that Mr. Argon was getting better, and I see that he looks well. How do you mean, looks well? <coughs> the master always looks very, very ill, and these are very impertinent fellows who told you he looks well. <coughs> I, I'm sorely grieved, sir. <laughs> I come from your daughter's singing master. She's been obliged to go into the country for a few days, and I, as her intimate friend, have come to take her place and to continue her lessons, for we fear that if she stops them, she may forget what she already knows. Very, very good. Uh, I should like to uh, call Angelique here. Uh, sir, I, I would think that I should uh, bring her to her room so that they may uh, have their lesson in private. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I should like to hear them perform within 
this area. Sir, it, uh, it would not be a good idea in your state to have such loud music. It could rattle your brain. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I am a lover of music, and I should very much, very much like to hear my daughter sing. Call her <laughs> Ah, daughter, you, you come opportunely. There is a young man here who has come to replace your single master, in, in order that you do not forget whatever it is that you have been learning. <laughs> uh, yes, there he is. Oh. What, 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 what is the surprise? Why, why, why the surprise? It's, 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 it is. It is a most exciting adventure, sir. Our father. I had a dream last night that I was in trouble, and a man, just like this man, he came and rescued me from the strait that I was in. And imagine, Father, upon coming here and finding the man who was in my dreams all night. It is being very fortunate to occupy your thoughts, whether waking or sleeping. <laughs> Upon my word, sir, um, I retract everything of which I spoke to you yesterday and am entirely on your side. Just now, uh, Dr. Deaforce and her son Thomas Deaforce are here to see you. Oh, what a lovely son-in-law you will have. You will see the most handsome and witty individual. He has said but two words which have delighted me. Mm. And your daughter will be charmed with him. Bring him in. Oh, in. oh so, sir, please stay. Uh, my daughter's promise to be is on his way, and they have not yet met each other, and I should very much like for you to stay and perform for the company. You are doing me much honor, sir, having me assist at such pleasant an interview. Yes, uh, I should like for you to invite her music master to the wedding, which is to take place in three days. I will not fail to do so. I invite you as well. Again, you are doing me much honor. Here we are. Let us all take our places. Uh, uh, madam, uh, Sir, please put on your face shield uh, for the sake of, of the company, for, for the sake of the poor <coughs> invalid as myself, <coughs> as you would know, uh, because you are doctors. <coughs> yes, well, our okay. goal is to help those who are sick, not bring them inconvenience. Well, we come here, so, sorry, continue. I'm My son Thomas and quite I sorry to show you that I could not come. The grace of the as I am sick, and, and I would and have loved to, to show you come in all things pertaining to our profession. Bring you into my home. home and Thomas, <laughs> approach and pay your respects. Is it not with the father that I ought to begin? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> father to whom I make bold to say I find myself more indebted than to the first. The first engendered me, but you have chosen me. The first received me out of necessity, but you have accepted me through kindness. What I have from him is the work of his body, <laughs> but what I have from you is the work of your will. And as inasmuch as the spiritual faculties are above the corporal, so much the more do I owe you, and so much the more do I hold precious this future affiliation of which I have come this day to render before you the very humble and very respectful homage. <laughs> See what it is to study! <laughs> Oh, long life to the colleges who turn out so able a man. Has this been right, Mother? Optimate. Come, salute this gentleman. Shall I kiss her? Yes, yes. <laughs> Mm. 
Madam, it is with justice that heaven has granted you the title of stepmother. It is not my wife you are speaking to, it is my daughter. Oh. <laughs> Where is she then? She will be on her way. Shall I wait, mother, until she comes? Uh, offer your compliments to the young lady. Yes. <laughs> Neither more nor less than the statue of Memnon gave forth an harmonious sound when it was illuminated by the rays of the sun. So do I feel my heart animated by a sweet transport of the sun of the, your charms. And as naturalists, naturalists observe that the flower called heliotrope turns incessantly towards that star of the day, so shall my heart henceforth turn to that resplendent star of your adorable eyes as to its only pole. Permit me then, miss, to offer at the altar of your charms uh, the offer of that heart that aims and aspires at no other glory than to be all its likeness, your very humble, very faithful, and very obedient servant and husband. Ah. Oh, what a wonderful thing it is to study. One learns to say such beautiful things. What do you say to this? Ah, uh, that this gentleman does wonders, and that if he be as good a physician as he is an orator, it would be a pleasure to be counted among his patients. <laughs> Agreed. Uh, he would be very lucky if his cures are as good as the speeches he gives. Uh, come, take a seat. what you would call sharp or wide awake, but he has always been seen as gentle, peaceable. He had all the difficulty in the world in teaching him to read, and at nine years of age, he still did not yet know his letters. But good, said I to myself, for it is the backwards trees that produce the best fruit. One cuts into marble with far more difficulty than into sand, but things are preserved much longer there. And that slowness of apprehension that dullness of imagination, it's a sign of future good judgment. When I sent him to college, he found it very hard, but he bore up against the difficulties, and it is because of this that he has gloriously obtained his diplomas, without vanity, might I add. He has made himself into a firm and respected opponent in a dispute, and it is because of this that I argue well of his judgment. But that which above all pleases me in him is that he attaches himself blindly to the opinions of the ancients and other opinions of the same kind. I have defended a thesis against the circulators, which, with the permission of your father, I make bold to present the, to this young lady as an homage which I owe to her of the first fruits of my mind. It's a useless piece of furniture to me, sir. I would have no use for it. Oh, give it here anyways. It's worth taking at least for the picture. <laughs> it will do nicely to decorate this room. <laughs> <laughs> well, so... Once more, with the permission of your father, I invite you to come and see, one of these days for your own amusement, of course, the dissection of a woman upon which I am to lecture. Oh, the entertainment will be pleasant. Oh, most would treat their mistress to a comedy, but this dissection will be gallant. As regards to wedlock and propagation, I can assure you that he is of the proper temperament to produce well-conditioned children. This is it not your intention, madam, for him to take his physician's exam, and then uh, go to court. 
Well, our profession when near the great has never appeared pleasant to me, and I found it best to stick with the public. But what's worrisome with the great is when they fall ill, they absolutely wish their physicians to cure them. Oh, <laughs> that, that's very funny. <laughs> They are very impertinent fellows to wish for you to cure them. You are not near them for that. You are there only to collect a check. It is for them to get better, if they can. <coughs> that is true. One only is obliged to treat people according to the rules. Well, then, sir, if you could prepare something for the company. Uh, I was awaiting your orders, sir. And an idea has just struck me to sing with the company the same with the lady a song which has recently been composed. Here, this is your part. I uh... do not object to it, pray, but let me make known to you the song that we are to sing. I have no voice for singing, but it is sufficient that I may make myself heard. And you all will, will have the kindness to excuse me, under the necessity which I find myself, to make the young lady sing. Is the poetry good? It's probably called a little improvised opera, and you only hear some rhythmical prose or some sort of blank verse as affection and necessity would suggest to two persons who speak on the spur of their moment or out of their own heads. Very well, be good. This is the plot of the scene. There was a young shepherd watching a play which had just begun. When he hears a noise at his side, he turns round, and he sees a coarse fellow who, with insolent words, was insulting a young shepherdess. He immediately espouses the interest of that sex which all men hold dear. And after casting off the fellow, he comes back to find a young person who, with the most lovely eyes he's ever seen, sheds tears which he thinks the most beautiful in the world. Alas, he says to himself, who would not, who can insult such an evil being? And what inhuman monster, what barbarian would not be touched by such tears? He busies himself to stop these tears, which he finds so sweet. And in doing so, she thanks him for this slight service. But in a way so tender, so charming, and so impassioned, that he can hardly resist it. And every glance, every word is to him a dart full of fire, with which his heart is pierced. Again, he says to himself, what would we not do? To what dangers would we not run to attract to ourselves but for a moment the attention of such beautiful a being? The whole of the play continues, and he can't pay the least attention to it, because the end of the play means the end of his time with the beautiful shepherdess. But he does leave, and carries with him a love as strong as a passion of several years' duration. See him immediately struck with all the ills of absence, no longer being able to see her whom he had only a short time. He does all he can to see her again, but she is kept under such close a guard, no matter what he can try, he cannot break through. Yet, even so, his love causes him to ask for her hand in marriage by means of a note, which he skillfully conveys. But at the same time, he hears that her father has projected to give her hand to another one. I know. And, and has projected to give her hand to another one. So he continues, and he decides, even in my sadness, even in my despair, he finds a way to enter her house, to ask her feelings, and to know the fate to which he must submit. He arrives to all that he fears. He witnesses the coming of this unworthy rival, who with the whims of a father puts against the tenderness of his love. He sees the ridiculous rival near the young shepherdess, as if the conquest were sure, and he'd already won. And the sight fills him with such anger <laughs> that he can hardly master it. But he does, out of respect for the shepherdess, and the presence of her father. But at a certain point, he can hold it back no longer. And the passion of his love leads him thus to speak. 
beauteous Phyllis. This is too much, too much to suffer. Can we break this cruel silence and bear your thoughts to me? Tell me my fate. Am I to live or am I to die? You behold me, Tirsus, sad and melancholy at the preparation for a marriage which alarms you. To heaven I lift my eyes, I look at you, I sigh. Need I tell you more? Lacrida, I, I had never thought to hear my daughter sing in such a way before company without hesitating. Oh. <laughs> Alas, fair Phyllis, could it be that the enamored Tirsus could be happy enough to find a place in your heart? I do not refuse to acknowledge in this impending grief. Yes, Tarsus, I love you. A word full of charms, have I heard rightly? Say it once more, Phyllis, I so that I may you. not doubt. I love you. For mercy's sake, once more, Phyllis. I love you. I love you. Say it a hundred times, do not get weary. I love you. I love you. Ye gods, ye kings, who look down upon the world beneath your feet, can you compare your happiness with mine? But, Phyllis, one thought comes to trouble this sweet bliss. A rival, a rival. Oh, I hate him more than death. He is to me, as he is to you, a cruel torture. Even so, Phyllis, a father wishes to compel you to obey his wishes. I will not consent to it. I will not consent to it. And what says the father to all this? He says nothing. <laughs> that, is, that is an impudent father to, to say nothing and, and let this not continue. This this shepherd. Tirsus. Uh, Tirsus and this shepherdess. Phyllis. Phyllis. Our impudent, insolent people. This, this shepherdess to go against the whims of her father. Such an insolent action. Uh, let me see here. What is written here? There is nothing but musical notes here. Have you not heard, sir, that it was recently invented to write the notes and the words in one? <laughs> Very good. Very good. We shall, we, we can do without your, your opera. I your thought to amuse you, sir. Nonsense does not amuse. Be gone, sir. You are dismissed. Ah, uh, why, if you come opportunely, uh, there is a Thomas Deoforest, the young man who is to wed our daughter. Madam, it is with justice that heaven has granted you the title of stepmother for we see in your face. I am so glad to come here opportunely to enjoy the pleasure of seeing you. <laughs> For we see in your face. For we see in your face. Madam, you have interrupted me in the midst of my sentence, and that has confused my memory. <laughs> oh, oh, madam, you have missed a great deal in having not been here at the second father, the statue of Memnon, and the flower called Heliotrope. Yes. Well, daughter. <coughs> I should like for you 
to place your head in his and pledge yourself to him as his wife. Father! Uh, father, what? Father, at least give us time to get to know each other and build up within us the mutual affection which is necessary to form a perfect union. As for me, miss, it has already entirely grown up in me, and I have no need to wait any longer. <laughs> well, if I may be so blunt, it is not yet built up in me. And if I'm being honest, your merit has not yet found a place in my heart. Daughter, you will have plenty of time for that in marriage. <laughs> Father, wedlock is a chain to which we should not subject a heart by force. And if this man were a man of honor, he would not be happy to take a wife's by, wife by means of coercion. Nego consequentiam, miss. And I may be a man of honor and still wish to accept you from the hand of your father. It is bad means of, do, of loving someone by doing them an injustice. Well, we read of the ancients, miss, that their custom was to carry away by force from the homes of their fathers, the daughters who were to be led to marriage, so that it not, would not seem that it would be by their own consent that they flew into the arms of a man. The ancients, sir, are the ancients. We are the people of present day. If we approve of a marriage, we know well enough how to walk into it without getting dragged into it. If you love me, sir, you should want everything that I want and give us time. Yes, but I should only want what you want up to the interests of my own love. <laughs> but the true act of love is giving into the wants of the other. This single miss, in what concerns not her possession, concedo, but in what concerns it, Nego. You may argue as much as you please. The gentleman is fresh from college, and he will always have your answer. <laughs> Why resist and refuse the glory of being attached to the body of the faculty? Perhaps she has some other inclination in mind. What is that? And that is nothing? Oh, my God. Darling, I should not force her to marry if I were you. And I know well enough what I would do. I know what you mean, madam, and the feelings which you have towards me. And I may warn you that it may not be as so happy as to be executed. It is because very circumspect and very respectable girls like you do not wish to obey and be submissive to the wills of their fathers. The that was very well in days gone by. The duty of a daughter has its limits, madam, and neither reason nor law extends it beyond these matters. So this means that your ideas are not adverse to marriage. Rather, you would like to choose your husband according to your own fancy. If my father cannot give me a husband whom I choose, I beseech him to at least not give me a husband whom I cannot love. I have begged your pardon. <laughs> We all have different means to marry. As for me, I, tr I would like to marry no one but someone who truly loves me, and I truly love them, and intends to make a lifelong commitment to them. And I confess to you that I am rather nervous about it. There are others, madam, to whom marriage is a commerce of sheer interest, who run without morals from husband to husband to obtain their wealth. They do not stand on so many ceremonies and have little regard for the persons themselves. <laughs> I find you in an excellent mood for arguing today, and I should like to know what you mean by that. What should I mean but what I said? You are so silly, my dear, that there is simply no bearing you any longer. You would like to provoke me, madam, into answering you out of anger, and I shall promise you that you will be a... you will not succeed! You are... Insolence is much less. Now, madam, you may say your best. You have a ridiculous pride, an impertinent presumption, which causes everybody else to shrug their shoulders. 
in good health. Good, good. That it is hard-ish, not to say hard. Very well. That it acts by fits and starts. By May. And even a little irregular. Often May. Which is a sign of intemperature and the splenetic parenchyma. Very good. Which means the spleen. Yes. But... My doctor says that, uh, uh, Dr. Prejean says that it is uh, the liver from which I, I suffer from. Well, yes. Whoever says parenchyma means the one and the other. On account of the close sympathy there is between them through the vas breve, the pylorus, and the miatus colodici, she no doubt orders you to eat much roast meat. Uh, no, no, nothing but boiled. Well, yes, roast boiled. Same thing. She prescribes very carefully to you. You couldn't be in better hands. Uh, madam, what should I put in my eggs? Uh, How much salt should I put in my eggs? Six, eight, ten. In even numbers, just as in medicine, in odd numbers. Thank you. You know that invalids cannot see people to the door. going out. You see, in passing by Angelique's room, I noticed a young man with her in her room. A, a young man? Yes. With he, my daughter? Yes, he ran in away. In her room? Yes. He ran away as soon as he saw me. But, but, your little daughter Louise was with them. She can tell you all the particulars. Bring her in, darling. Of course. Ah, uh, I knew she is a flirt. That daughter of mine, no wonder she would not consent to that marriage. Uh, what do you wish for me, Papa? Uh, My come, stepmother told me you want me. Come closer, Louis Long. Come closer. Speak a little louder. Uh, was there nothing that you were meant to say to me? Uh, well, I, I will tell you if you like to amuse you. The story of the donkey skin, or the fable of the raven and the fox, which I've been taught lately. That is not what I speak of. Well, what then? Had I not told you, dear, to, to tell me, to report to me everything that you saw and heard? Yes, Papa. And have you reported everything that you have seen and heard? Yes, Papa. I have come and told you everything I saw. Every single thing? Yes, Papa. Aha. Well then, I shall teach you to tell me everything. Papa! Yes, yes. There was something that took place with your sister. This is easier to carry. That, that she, you have not yet told me. And, and I am quite sure of it that you are lying to me. Uh, uh, Papa! Come, come here that I may, that I'm, May beat it out of you. Uh, I, I, I ask your friend, Papa. It's because my sister, my sister told me not to talk. 
tell you, but I'm going to tell you all. Well then, because you have lied, I shall have to beat you. Uh, Papa! Bring your bum in this direction. I did, Papa. Pardon me. Come here, Louis Arn. Uh, dear Papa, do not whip me. I... Louis Arn? In, in heaven's name, Papa, do not whip me. <laughs> you hurt me, hurt me. Wait, 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 wait. I am dead. <laughs> Thank you. 
and I, I do not even have the strength to speak. Oh, that is bad. I come hither, brother, to propose to you a match for my niece. No, 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 I, no. Do not speak to me of that wretch, that impudent child of mine. Do not speak to me of her. I shall place her into a convent, convent within soon. She, I have, I have discovered an affair of which they have not, they do not know that I know of it yet. That is right. I'm so very glad to see your strength is coming back a little. It would seem my visit has done you good. We will discuss business by and by. I wish to bring you to an entertainment with which I have fallen that will dissipate your chagrin and make you better disposed for what we are to talk about. They are gypsies, dressed as moors, who perform song, intermixed with dance, with which I'm sure you will be pleased. It will be better for you than any of Madame Perjan's prescriptions. Come along.
talk a little together, brother. Uh, yes, but just just a moment, sister. Uh, stay, sir. You forget you cannot walk without your walker. You are you are right. <laughs> if you please, of the interests of your niece. I shall try to get for her everything that she wishes. <sighs> Good. We must absolutely prevent this extravagant match that he has taken into his own head. And I have thought it would be a good idea to bring into the house a doctor of our own choosing to disgust him with his Dr. Proujean and to cry down on her treatments of him. <laughs> but seeing as we have no one on hand to do this, I have decided to play a trick of my own. <laughs> How? Oh, it is a whimsical idea, and it is likely to be more lucky than prudent. <laughs> Let me manage and act you on your part. Oh, here comes our man, remember, act you on your part. <clears throat> you will allow me, brother to ask you before all things, not to excite yourself in the conversation I wish to have with you. Yes. And that you would reply to me without any bitterness. Yes. And that we may argue together with minds free from all passion. Good heavens, what a great deal of preamble, yes. Whence comes it, brother, that having the property you have and having only one daughter, for I do not count the one. Whence comes it that you speak of placing her in a convent? Whence comes it, sister, that I am master in my own house and may do as I will in my own household? Your wife does not fail to advise you to get rid in this way of your two daughters, for I'm sure, through a spirit of charity, she would be delighted to see them both good nuns. There, there it is. It is, it is the poor woman at once Mention it is to her that, that everyone has a grudge with. It is with her that everyone has a grudge with. And and it, it is let she is the one who does all the wrong. Let us leave her out of the question. She is a woman with the best possible intentions for your family. She is devoid of all self-interest, shows a wonderful tenderness towards you, and shows an inconceivable amount of love and affection for your children. No, let's not speak of her. Let us turn and say to your, my niece, what is the idea of having her marry the son of a doctor? The idea is, sister, of having within my own family a doctor, a physician, who can direct me, supply me with the prescriptions, the, the medicine, the consultations which I need in order to make myself better. This is not your daughter's case, brother, and a more suitable match presents itself. Yes, but this one is more suitable to me. Is the husband she is to take, brother, for you or for her? Well, he must be both for her and for me, but a well-disposed daughter ought to marry that which is advantageous to her father. And for this reason, if your little daughter was grown up, would you have her married apothecary? Oh, uh, why not? <laughs> Is it possible that you can be so wrapped up in your doctors and apothecaries, and yet you wish to be ill in spite of nature and mankind? Uh, how do you make that out, sister? I make that out, brother, that I see no man who is less ill than you, <coughs> and I should wish for no better constitution than your own. <coughs> A great proof that you are in perfectly good health and have a perfectly sound body, is the fact that, as of yet, you have not succeeded in spoiling the goodness of your constitution, <coughs> and you are not dead yet with all of the remedies that they have made you take. But uh, how sure are you that it is not through these, these, this medicine that, that I am kept in the, the best health that I am kept in? Uh, Madame Pajon said that I should succumb. I should die if she were to let me, leave me alone for, for four days. If you do not look to it, brother, Madame Pajan will take such good care of you, she will send you into the next world. 
Be that as it may, sister, what then do you say that we should do when we are ill? Nothing. We should not see a physician. It is not necessary for salvation for us to see them. Nothing. Nothing, brother. If we leave nature alone, she will remedy herself the discord in which she has fallen. It is our impatience, our anxiety, that spoils all. And more men die of their diseases than of their remedies. Then, sister, you do not believe in, in the great establishment of, of medicine. The foundation which has been procured, has been prepared within times gone by. You do not believe in the power of medicine. Far from believing it, brother. And I believe that it is one of the greatest follies of mankind. And to look at things philosophically, I do not see any more amusing mummery, nothing more ridiculous than one man attempting to cure another. You do not think then, sister, that, that one man is able to, to heal another? No, and this is why. There are some physicians who believe in the common error from which they profit. And there are other physicians who profit from it without even believing it. Take your Madame Perjan, for example. She would dispatch you with the most implicit faith, and in killing you, only do what she would have done for her husband, or her children, or to meet me, even herself. You say that because you bear a grudge against her from infancy. And I should think, lastly, that, that, that perhaps we should bring in Madame Perdon and Madame Ferron to come in, those venerable doctors that they are, to come in and argue with you and bring you down a peg or two. I, brother, I do not assume the task of combating the faculty. What I have said is merely between you and myself. Any man may believe whatever he wishes. I have only wish to dispel you a little bit of this error in which you have fallen, and to take you for your amusement to see a play written by Moliere on this subject. Your Moliere is a very impudent man to bring such venerable persons as the doctors on the stage. He makes such good fun of them. He does not make fun of physicians, merely the ridiculousness of their practice. There, there is his foolishness. If I were a physician, I should very much like to take my vengeance upon the man. I, I should tell him, should he, should he fall ill, perhaps a cold, perhaps a very bad fever, I should, I should leave him alone. I should let him die on his own. I should tell him, die, die, die. That will teach you to, to, to make fun of the faculty. <laughs> very angry with him, brother. Yes, yes, quite so. Very well, and to change our conversation, I shall tell you on the account of the trifling repugnance of your daughter <coughs> not to take up the violent resolution of placing her in a convent, and that when it comes to a match and a choice in son in law, you should not give way to this passion that blindly carries you away. And in that manner, when it comes to a match, you should give, in, you should give inclinations to the inclinations of your daughter. Somewhat for it's her life, and upon her depends the happiness of the union. Who's ready for their enema? I am. Uh, just a moment, sister. I must, I must take this for a moment. Hey, you were just seeing. Cannot you go a moment without some enema? Put it off a little. Uh, one will be for the evening, and the other for the morning. Hold up. How dare you oppose the prescription? of the faculty and prevent me from giving this sick old man <coughs> his enema. It's very ridiculous of you to be so rash. Be gone, madam, for we see that you are not accustomed to speaking to people's faces. One that should not thus make fun of medicine. I have come here with nothing but good prescription drugs. And I shall- And now, I'm gonna have to go tell Madame Poujon how I've been treated, how I've been prevented from doing my job. You know what? Take this. You are going to be sorry when she hears about this. 
Uh, I fear you, you will be the cause of some great mishap here, sister. A great mishap, not to take an enema from Madame Perjean. Honestly, brother, is there no way of curing you for your mania of physicians that you should be buried in their remedies all of the days of your life? It is easy for you to say that. You are in such good health. <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> I am a sick old man. But what illness have you, brother? You will drive me mad. on the bowels. I would love, it, it was my sister. It is a most daring deed, an enormous outrage against the medical profession. It, it was not I. A crime of high treason against the faculty which cannot be sufficiently punished. Oh, but madame. I declare that I break off all connection with you, that I no longer desire an alliance with you, and that to make an end of all union with you, oh. there is the deed of gift which I made to my nephew no. in favor of oh. the marriage. Oh, oh my, <laughs> madame, come down all the money. <laughs> She despised my enema. Uh, I wouldn't have cured would you before long. I, I was going to cleanse your body and drive out all the bad humors. But as you do not wish to be cured by my hands, I wish to since be cured you have withdrawn from the obedience of the man who owes his position, uh, since you have declared yourself a rebel against remedies uh, I, I have prescribed for you, I must tell you that I give you up to your bad constitution, uh, the uh, temperature of your bowels, uh, the acrimony of your bile, the corruption uh, of your blood, uh, and the feculence uh, of your humor. Uh, and I will that in four days you uh, shall be in an incurable state. Uh, oh my God. Into a bread of Pepsia, a bread of Pepsia, into dyspepsia, from dyspepsia, into apoxy, from apoxy, into lyentery, from dysentery, into dropsy, from dropsy, into a privation of life, whither your folly will lead you. <laughs> to see you. Uh, uh, what, what doctor? A 
doctor of the faculty, of course. I ask you who he is. Well, I do not know who he is, but he is as like me as two drops of water. And if I were not certain that my mother was an honest woman, I would think that this was some little brother that she has given me since the death of my father.
from kingdom to kingdom in search of illustrious materials for my art to find patients worthy of my care, capable of having applied to them the great and beautiful secrets of my art. I disdain to amuse myself with trifling rheumatisms, small colds, vapors, <laughs> headaches, no, I want diseases of importance, real intermittent fevers with a disorder brain, real purple legs, real confirmed dropsy, this is what I desire. That is where I triumph. And I would desire, sir, that you would be forgotten by every physician in the world, discouraged of, to the point of death, that I might show you the effectiveness of my art and the desire I have to be of service to you. I, I am your humble servant, yes, yes, sir. Oh, come, let me feel your pulse. Come now, beat as you ought. Come. Oh, this pulse plays the impertinent. I will make you go as you ought. You have not yet met the likes of me. Tell me, who is your physician? Uh, Doctor, uh, Madame, Doctor Poujon. Oh, this Doctor Poujon is not in my little notebook among the great physicians. From what? Does she say you suffer? At times, she says I, I suffer from, well, she says I suffer from the liver, but others say I suffer from the spleen. Oh, they are fools, all of them. It is from the lungs which you are ill. The lungs? Yes, tell me, what do you feel? I feel from, Time to time, some some qualms. The lungs. I I see before my eyes a mist. At times, the lungs. I I I I feel from time to time as if I I get a heartburn. Oh, the lungs. I, and and my my stomach. Oh, it hurts so bad at times. I, I feel as though I, I am being attacked by the colics. Oh, the lungs, the lungs, I tell you. <coughs> tell me, do you relish your food? Yes, the yes, lungs, yes, the yes. lungs, do you? <coughs> like to take a little bit of wine? Yes, yes, the yes. The lungs, yes. the lungs, I tell you, do you? Feel the inclination to sleep, and are you? Happy when you go to sleep? Yes, yes, oh, yes, the yes. the lungs, the lungs, I tell you. What does your doctor order you to eat? She, she orders me pepperoni pizza at times. Be a ignorant woman. Some, some broccoli with cheese. Be a ignorant woman. At times, she, she has me have some beef broth, beef, beef liver broth. Be ignorant woman. Oh, at times as well, she she has me take beetroot. The ignorant woman. And, and and in the evening, she has me take some diluted wine to wash everything down. Ignorantus, ignorantus, ignorantus. You must to thicken your blood, take your wine pure and eat good. Solid beef, good solid pork, good Dutch cheese, rice and groats and chestnuts and thin cakes to thicken and conglutinate. Your doctor is an ass. And I shall send you one of my own who's far better and visit you myself from time to time when I am in this town. I, I am much obliged, oh. sir. <coughs> What the deuce do you want with this arm? My arm? 
But yes, I would have this removed instantly if I were you. <laughs> Remove my arm. Do you not see how it attracts to itself all the nutrients in your body and keeps that side from growing? <laughs> yeah, yes, but, but I want my arm. You have a right eye there, too, that I would have taken out as well immediately. <laughs> Do not move. Oh, 
Here comes my mistress. Please Steady as you are. by my respects and entreaties, to convince him to grant you to my love. Oh, Leon, let us no longer talk of marriage. With the loss of my father, I no longer belong in this world, and I renounce it forever. Oh, Father, if I have just now opposed your inclinations, I shall now fulfill your intentions, and be remiss for some of the grief that I am sure I have caused you. Oh, Father, please take my hand and forgive me for all that I have done. Oh, oh, 
please, at least do not give me the man I cannot love. Oh, sir, do not show yourself opposed to her prayers or mine. And would you not allow yourself to be touched by the mutual strength of our affection? Can you really hold out, brother? Can you be so opposed to such love? Uh, uh, all right, you may be together after, after. You may marry my daughter after you become a physician yourself. <laughs> oh, my heart, sir. This is not much to do, and I would do many other things. Um, if you would give me the fair answer, I'll become an apothecary even if you want me to. Brother, a thought has just come to my mind. Why not become a doctor yourself? The convenience will be all the more greater to have all of the knowledge inside of you. Yes, and this is the quickest way to ensure that you are cured. Also, there is no one as impertinent a person to argue with a member of the faculty. In, indeed. Uh, but, uh, sister, you, you must be jesting with me. Uh, am I not too old to study? To study? That is good. But you are learned enough, and there are many physicians who are not more clever than you. Mm. Oh. If it weren't for your beard alone, which goes a great length already, for the beard makes up more than half of the physician. Oh. In any case, I'm ready to do everything. You will have this thing done immediately? How, how immediately? Yes, yes, and in your own home. In my own home? Yes, there are a body of physicians. Friends of mine, who can come instantly and perform the ceremony right here in your own hall, it will cost you nothing. Uh, but, uh, what, what am I to do? What should I say? They will give you two words in what you are to say, and the rest they will instruct you in writing. <laughs> now go, get on a decent dress, and I shall get them. What do you mean by this? What do you understand by these physician friends of yours? What is your plan? To amuse ourselves a little this evening. <laughs> there are some comedian friends of mine who have been together a small play about the installation of a physician. And I should wish for my brother to play the personal personage in it. We can each take a role and therefore perform the play for each other. The carnival authorizes all of it. Come, let us get everything ready. <laughs> Husband. I do. You may kiss the bride. No, 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 no,